Welcome to LOA Today. I'm Walt Thiessen here with Life Coach Cindy Chavez. Today is Wednesday, February the 26th, 2020. It's 4 p.m. New York time and wherever you are in the world, thank you for joining us for another episode of LOA Today, your daily dose of happy. And normally I'd be saying happy Neville Day to you, Cindy, but uh, we, we, we're kind of neveled out for a bit and we're going to be switching gears today. So uh, that's a good thing, don't you think? I think it's a good thing. And I also was thinking, well, we we're so we've been so um, immersed in Neville for the past couple of years mm. that all of Neville's methods and ideas, they will bubble to the top of whatever other thing we're talking about anyway. I, oh, I, undoubtedly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I yeah. think we, we can count on that. That's for sure. <laughs> so if you're a Neville listener and you're here with us, just hang in and see what you think. <laughs> Thanks for being a listener too. We love that. It's, it's wonderful. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, we're kind of um, multidimensional in our LOA. We we don't just listen to one teacher or one guru. We we listen to a lot. We listen to inside. That's you know probably the best place to listen. But uh, you know, I I I know that you're like me, and that we'll we'll take uh, inner wisdom wherever we can find it. <laughs> right. Seriously. Yeah. And I think that's probably the most important thing is to be able to hear what your own inner wisdom is saying to you, right? I mean, you know, but I remember one time I was looking for a book. I don't mean a book on my shelf. I mean, I was just like searching for a new book. And I heard my inner wisdom say pretty loudly, uh, you don't need a new book. You need to put into practice all the things you know already. (laughs) Yeah. I was like, oh, ouch. Okay. Yeah. So it's like, (laughs) you know, we can take in so much knowledge and we can listen to so many teachers, but if we want those things to have to, to to produce results in our life, then we have to put them into practice because none of this stuff works in theory, right? Well, it all works in theory, but it works a whole lot better in practice. (laughs) 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 And I've been, I mean, our listeners know that I've been uh, wrestling with the practice a lot lately because I've been working on a programming project that, I mean, first of all, you may remember that I gave up programming because I was you know, yes. done with it. And here I am doing programming again. Um, <laughs> never, never really expected that. Never. Was gonna That's right. Yeah, exactly. And it's been an opportunity, among other things, to practice staying high vibration in the face of stuff that can really drive you to low vibration. And I, I'm thinking that's a good thing. That's kind of like weightlifting. You know, it's kind of like work, working out at the gym because when you really push your muscles, they build. You know? Yes, right. And that's exactly. what I feel I'm doing. I feel like I'm building my my inner being, my emotional, vibrational muscles, so to speak. So here's an interesting thing about that idea. And that is because sometimes people start to learn about law of attraction, about vibration, about conscious creating, whatever you want to call it. And anytime they feel something that's uncomfortable, they immediately try to go in a different direction. And in doing that, sometimes they really start making any discomfort, any pain, any feelings they don't like, any situations they don't like, they put them over in the bad category. Yes. And decide, oh, that's not good. That's not good. I'm supposed to keep a high vibration. I'm supposed to be feeling good, right? And and then what happens is they start this process of shaming themselves inwardly anytime they have any bad emotions or bad feelings or they have a situation in their life that you know isn't to their liking so there's a there's a hot that's it's not that that's terrible right to to recognize what we like and what we don't what we prefer what we don't prefer what feels good and what doesn't feel good Um, Because we're human and that's what we're going to do. We're going to recognize all of that. But there's there's a higher level than just pushing it all away and, you know, burying our head in the sand or turning our back toward it. And that is really greatly explained in the example you just gave. Going to the gym, right? So you're going to the gym. And I can speak to this from experience because in my past, (laughs) (laughs) I was a weightlifter, Uh right? And so we go to the gym. And we work out and we maybe work out really hard and our muscles feel sore because of it. Mm -hmm. However, you know, if, if I go and I maybe work really hard and the next day, oh, my, my back is hurting or my legs are really (laughs) sore from all this heavy lifting. I don't mean working out. I mean like work, right? Mm. Like physical work. I might, I might think, oh man, I worked too hard yesterday. Like this doesn't feel good at all. 
However, if I'm going to the gym and I have a goal in mind, like my goal is to get stronger, my goal is to build muscle, my goal is to, you know, whatever my goal is, and I feel sore, that soreness can actually have a, a tinge of pleasure to it. So I'm like, ooh, it's working. My <laughs> legs are burn. sore, right? Right. And it's like, oh, that means something's happening here. I'm My muscles are getting stronger. And so you know, it's the same sensation, but it's just a different frame. And so I think that that's a kind of around that spiral, right? It's, it's like coming around a little higher. It's coming around to a, a different way of looking at it to where when things in our life don't feel good, how can we reframe it to where it's not so painful? And it's, it's advanced practice. It, it, it is advanced <laughs> practice. I think the key there, the word there that's most important is practice, to actually practice anyway. Mm -hmm. Because I, to give you an example, I mean, we, we're using a gym example, right? Well, I joined a gym about a year ago. I went six times and then I was done. And, you know, I... I just don't like gyms. I, I just don't. I like being outside. I prefer taking walks and, do, you know, doing outside activities. So I said, okay, well, I'm not going to torture myself with something I don't really want to do. I might as well do stuff that I like to do. So, like I said, one of my favorite things to do is to go for a long walk and usually at a pretty brisk pace. And what would often happen the first oh, couple of years that I did that was, like you said, I'd come back home and my, my ankles would be sore, my Legs would be sore, my knees, my thighs. I, 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 oh, geez, and then I'm tired and all this other kind of stuff. And I went any day anyway. You know, I, 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 sometimes I appreciate the burn. Sometimes I was kind of tired of the burn. But, but <laughs> right. I kept going. I kept going. And in the right. kept going part, what ended up happening is the burn went away. It got to the point where I could do like my four to six mile walk and not feel anything. It'd be like, oh, wow, there's like power going on here. Right. All because I worked past that part. Yes. If I had stopped, like I stopped going to the gym, I'm not going to get the results I'm looking for. Right. Yeah. So and it, that's, it, we talked about that a week or so ago because of something that Neville said when we were doing the Neville book, but it just mm -hmm. reminded me of it. And that's it. That's exactly it. It's being able to keep going. We, it was the valley of discomfort, I think, or the valley of disappointment. That's what they yes, call it. Yes, that's right. right. Yes, yes. It's that the beginning place where you try a new practice. Because we've talked about this before, and I've heard it in my coaching business, and we see it in some of the LOA groups where people will say, I'm doing all the right things, and it's not working. Right? <laughs> that's that valley of disappointment. That's where you're doing all the right things, and you're not seeing any results yet. And that's that's the time when unfortunately most people quit. That's true. Yeah. And that's why you hear people say, whether it's whether it's the law of attraction, a spiritual practice, or a physical thing, they're like, I've tried a diet, it didn't work. I've gone to the gym, it didn't work. I've tried law of attraction, it didn't work. I've I've gone out and socialized, it didn't work. Whatever it is, it's because they probably quit right before it was going to start working. They just gave up. And so keep going. Exactly. <laughs> keep yeah. going. And if you, you know, I also like your t your uh, take about from the Sudbury School, right? I mean, sometimes you you need to just try something different. That's right. Right. So. Oh yeah. If, yeah. If it's not working and it's not working, it's not working. Switch it up and try something different, but don't quit altogether. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I I knew that I had quit on the gym early. I mean, I didn't want to do the gym is what I really discovered. I didn't like it. There was nothing right. about it that I enjoyed. I didn't, I really wasn't, I mean, literally, you know what I was doing in the gym? I was running a treadmill. I'm just like, what, why am I on a treadmill when I can be outdoors? <laughs> well, besides the fact that you live somewhere where it possibly could be like four degrees outside. I mean, <laughs> well, yeah, there right is that. <laughs> Slight consideration there, I have to admit, yes. Oh, that's funny. But, yeah. and, and and what we're talking about here applies to all areas of life, but it, it particularly applies to the area that we've decided we're going to concentrate on for the next few weeks or months or whoever knows how long. I mean, last time we said we'd do it for a while, it took a year and a half. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we decided we're going to talk about relationships in part because that's where you focus your business mainly. Most of your clients um, in your coaching practice are right. contacting you about relationships. But also because, I mean, it's one of the big three. It's probably tied for number two 
or to, to, tied for number one with with money as the, yeah. the two things that people are most interested in when it comes to attracting stuff using the law of attraction or the law of assumption or whatever law you want to call it. Right. But you know that's what they're interested in. So yeah. we figured, okay, well, let's focus on some relationships a bit. Yeah. And it makes sense because in the world we live in, we need money for just about everything. Mm -hmm. And as human beings, we are wired for connection. We're small group primates. We we thrive in connection with other human beings. So that's the relationship thing. And then the third thing that you didn't mention is usually health. Yes. Uh, people well. wanting to improve their health, uh, personal growth, um, you know, learning new things. And all of that is in our nature as well, right? I always think it it's the nature of nature to expand. So we always want to be expanding. It's a, it's a normal thing to want that. Interestingly enough, most of us put health number three on that list of money relationships and health, which is ironic because without the health, you really can't do the other two. I, I was <laughs> just speaking to somebody today and she's been a very close friend of mine, my best friend for years and years, decades. And, um, and she's older than I am. And we, what we were talking about, was these kind of things like the things we want, the things we're trying to create, you know, but I, we both mentioned to each other, speaking of her because she's 70 years old and she's in great shape and she's in perfect health and she doesn't take any kind of medicines or anything like that. I mean, she's just really, really thriving in, in vibrant health. She and her husband both, and they've had a, you know, long, long marriage and they were high school sweethearts and they're completely love being together. They are like the, they're the example, you know, of like the mm -hmm. model relationship. And I was like, you know, you have, you have something that so many people want, right? You have your health, you have a wonderful relationship and you have everything you need. And it's so true that you're right. We, we kind of put that, I think it's that if we're feeling good, it goes on the back burner. Sure. Oh yeah. yeah Which kind of points to the fact we, we forget <laughs> about appreciating. I mean, but there's so many things that we have to appreciate, uh, but if we don't really notice it because it isn't irritating us at the moment, we forget about it. Yeah. Well, I think that's, I think that's the thing is, you know, you hear about gratitude practice. As soon as you get into law of attraction, you read anything, you're going to start reading about the practice of being, you know, grateful. Pretty for much. What and it's so true that we all should, even if we are not in optimum health, we can be grateful for the health we do have. Right. Absolutely. Talked about this lots of times. Yeah. And as far as, you know, relationship, it's funny as a relationship coach, I kind of see everything as a relationship. So I, I see our relationship with our body mm. um, as part of that health equation. I see our relationship with money as, you know, part of that equation. Generally speaking, I am dealing with interpersonal, right. Relationships right. and how people communicate and people that want relationships. So so I'm looking forward to this. I hope that we do get response from people that are our listeners. Um, we would love it if you would send us questions. Um, you know, let us know what you want to talk about in the in the arena of relationship because it's something I could talk for days about. So, <laughs> and we will because we're yeah. going. This is not just for today. We're going to be doing this every week for the next bunch of Wednesdays. So yeah, by so all means, whatever you know, whatever the big relationship challenges are. Um, and and I don't know if you had anything in your mind for today, Walt, or if people are, I, I don't pay, I, I, well, I can't see what's going on in our video feed. So I know sometimes people will chat in the chat of our video feed, people that watch our podcast live. Uh, well, we are getting some, some people commenting, no questions coming through, but if you're listening to the live stream, by all means, put something into the chat and we'll pick that up and, and talk about it. Uh, Jeffrey's, uh, as usual, saying, I'm excited to stir the pot, mix it up. Let's co-create. <laughs> okay, let's do it. Well, you know, I, I will say something that was on my mind and I, I posted about it uh, on Facebook today is that in my over a decade of coaching, one of the things I've heard more than once is that people will say women, I generally coach women. Um, mm -hmm. I do coach men too, mm -hmm. but the majority of my uh, clients are women. And so I will hear women say there are no good men out there. Of course, we're talking <laughs> about women who are heterosexual and want to have a heterosexual um, right. relationship. But it could be the same thing for anybody, no matter what your Absolutely. sexual orientation and whether you're a man or a woman. If you're a man, you may say there aren't any good women out there. You know, it's like it's just a, a thought. And I used to say that, too. It's, it's a thought. Right. And mm -hmm. so I started 
thinking about it, thinking about um, either there are no good men out there or all the men out there only want one thing or the men are not, res <laughs> or the men are not respectful or um, all the men that seem interested in me are unavailable or married. I, I mean, these are all real scenarios that people will bring up. Um, have people say, oh my gosh, like every time a guy, you know, is interested in me, then I find out he's married or I find out that he doesn't really want a relationship or I find out, you know, so all of these things are really pretty common. Oh yeah. And so I started kind of brainstorming on the reasons, and especially in the frame of law of attraction. And it's like, okay, I know that you think there are no good men out there, but that's just not true. There are plenty of good men out there. You just can't see them. So why are they invisible? To and you? By, the, by the way, as one of those men many years ago, some 21 years ago, uh, when I was still in the single realm, actually before that, because I met Louise that year. But back then, I would ask the flip side of that question, because I would hear all the time, there aren't any good men out there. And I'd say, but I'm one. Right, raising my hand. Can't you I'm notice crazy. me? <laughs> <laughs> I, and I marveled at that because it, it, it seemed like literally, I mean, I was hearing that a lot. Mm -hmm. I, I heard a, a whole lot. And it, it would almost always be accompanied by, well, I mean, you're accepted. I said, well, thank you very much. You know, are you, maybe you might actually be interested in me sometime. Oh, no, 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 no. You're just a friend. You know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I mean, it's very, it's very interesting why um, the good men out there might be invisible, mm -hmm. and right, and and it's always going to come back to the stories that we tell, and it's going to come back to our identity, those those two things which are also interconnected, mm -hmm. and so I was trying to come up with reasons, and. One of the reasons I was thinking about was if you if you've been hurt in the past, mm. right? If you've been hurt in the past, you will automatically put up some energetic boundaries. Like, have you ever heard someone say that someone has walls put up? Oh yes, <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> I've known a few. <laughs> right, or even like seriously, like sometimes people will say get a, a a job or be involved in a group of people and they will try you know i don't even mean um intimate relationships maybe just trying to make a friendship sure. with somebody and they'll say wow they have a lot of walls up like they're they're untouchable they're hard to to get to know or they or they yep. don't seem interested well if you've been hurt you may automatically put those walls up mm -hmm. and here's the thing men who are sensitive and caring they 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 know those walls are there and they respect those walls so they exactly. back off yes um right men who don't care about your boundaries and don't care what you've been through and they just want what they want they may push right past that so so that's one of the reasons why some women say all the guys that you know approach me they're always like bad boys right they're always <laughs> they're not good men they're like it's like well the good men are there but they take a step back when you mm -hmm. have walls up. So that's one of the reasons. Um, I remember one time I had a client that I asked a question to. Um, what is the number one thing that you want in a partner? Yeah. And they said they wanted to be respected. And I said, well, what would that look like if somebody really respected you? And they started saying, well, you know, um, I'll go out with someone and they will interrupt me and they will talk over me and they won't seem to really care about my opinion. And they'll do things like call me late at night when I've asked them not to. And I just let this client go on for a little while before saying, okay, you know, I asked you, what does respect look like? And you gave me all these examples of disrespect. And it really was a kind of mind blower for them. I remember them saying, it's like, Oh, wow. Okay. Let's talk. Okay. Let's brainstorm then because she had lots of respect, lots of uh, experience, right? With disrespect. Mm -hmm. She knew what sure. that looked like. Yeah. That's the other thing is if you've been in a relationship where you were not treated well, mm -hmm. that sometimes those experiences, uh, there's, they're still so charged for you. 
that you see them everywhere, mm -hmm. right? It's really easy for you to spot that disrespectful behavior. It's really easy for you to uh, see that. And it, it, it renders the other things, the good things, the good guys, it renders them sort of invisible. The other thing is the story that you tell about yourself. Oh, yes. And that's remember that our relationship stuff, our relationships are always like a big mirror. So <laughs> it's like, okay, so what do you want? You want to be respected. You want to be cherished. You want to be pampered. You want to be loved. You want to be seen and heard. And you want to have a good, you know, someone, you want to be with someone that has a really great opinion of you and that sees your unique gifts and talents. And okay. So where are you with all that? Do you treat yourself with respect? Do you give yourself credit for all of your unique gifts and talents? Do you pamper yourself? Do you, do you love yourself? You know, that's because that's what's going to be shining back at you as a literally like a mirror of, of all of your thoughts about yourself. Well, also the, the literal mirror will reflect that back to you. If you look, if, I, I can tell you a story because you know I that I am in a, a wonderful marriage now, but Hooray. but uh, I I got divorced in 2008, and it was a long marriage that was not a good marriage, mm -hmm. and I was really working hard to frame it as being as good as it could be, and this is what I always I tell people this story when. They are trying to LOA <laughs> a relationship. In other words, they're in a relationship that's not a good relationship, and they are trying to shift it around by with their thoughts. Now, I'm not saying that can't be done. Sure. What I am saying is that if you're in a relationship and you're not being treated well, then you can do the inner work to yourself, and there will be a result. But it's not always the result that the other person changes. Sometimes it's a result that the other person leaves because <laughs> ah. you're not a match anymore. Right. Right. Because suddenly you're giving yourself all this self-love and respect and suddenly there's no match. That's what I realized. And talk about a literal mirror. Mm -hmm. One day I was walking through my house and I caught a glimpse of my face in a literal mirror and my brain interpreted it as the saddest face I've ever seen. Mm, yes. Mm -hmm. I still remember that day. And I, and I recognized at that moment, okay, it's time for me to be honest that I am miserable. Mm -hmm. It's time for me to take a look at what's going on because I've tried to put a happy face over it. And that's not what law of attraction is. It is not just covering everything up and refusing to be honest. Right? And, and that mirror is honest. The mirror is quite honest. <laughs> it was so honest. I mean, it really and is to, to, to the point of annoyance, but it, it's, <laughs> it's actually a great tool. I mean, I, I'll give you an example out of the public realm. Um, my wife and I were watching some program about the royal family in, in Britain, and Princess Anne came on the screen. And Louise commented that Princess Anne is somebody who's not a particularly positive person, tends to find fault with everything. And you could see it on her face. Her face was bitter and angry. This is a person who lives a privileged life. I mean, talk about abundance. This person's got it coming out of her ears and all she can find is what's wrong with the world. You could see it on her face. Well, you know, sometimes when we are not, and I, I recognize that when we, we look at somebody that has so much in the physical realm, right? So much money, so much, like you said, privilege. Um, then it seems like, what do they have to be miserable about? But we do have a lot of human needs that aren't connected to money. Absolutely. And when those, when those human needs are not met, we will feel miserable or uncomfortable. And so, so and if we are of the mindset that that's bad and wrong, then we often have strategies of dealing with it that aren't particularly healthy. Mm -hmm. Like either we don't fix it, we don't get the need met, so then we're just miserable all the time, or we hide the misery and we pretend that everything is great, right? Because so it's like if I fake it till I make it, you know, if I pretend, then everything will shift and be great, and that's not necessarily true either. 
Mm -hmm. Sometimes we just need to get really honest about what's happening and about what we would like to have instead. Yes. Yeah, right? that kind of specificity is really important. No right. Doubt. Yeah. And By then, the way, we, we do have a first question. Oh, I want I want a question. Yeah, and and of course it's from Jeffrey. I mean, uh, Jenny's also saying <laughs> a few others are, are tuning in too. Pot, but, but but Jeffrey is definitely spraying <laughs> the pot here. He says his question: <laughs> Can you talk about the difference between loving yourself and narcissism? Oh, that's a great question. Isn't that good? It's a really great question. Yeah. Yes. Um, and I am not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, so I don't diagnose in my practice and I may have as much or maybe a little more, I don't know, knowledge than the average person about these things just because I study human behavior a lot, but we all have a little bit of narcissism, mm -hmm. right? Now, this is what I want you to picture. When we talk about something, let's talk about something else first as an example and say, have you ever been angry? Okay. And what if we dialed the anger way down? and called it something else. I don't know, frustration, maybe feeling irritable, right? If we, if we turn that knob way up, it may be just rage, right? Like there's a level here. <laughs> and so most of us can say, well, yeah, of course I've been angry before. And of course I, you know, hey, I felt irritated just last night when X, Y, Z happened, right? But how many of us would say, oh yeah, I go around in a total rage, like most of the time. Well, most of us aren't. <laughs> going around in a total rage most of the time, right? Hopefully not. Hopefully. Not. If you look at narcissism by degrees, most of us have a little bit of narcissism. What we And hopefully we do. Like there can be a healthy amount. That healthy amount is that I do recognize that I have gifts and talents, right? I do recognize that I can do good things in the world. I do recognize my good qualities. Um, do I love myself? Yes. But now if we just turn that up to where it, it's so magnified that we don't care about anyone else, then we're getting over, right? And then the other part of it is, and I am not an expert here, but when we talk about narcissism, it often kind of goes uh, hand in hand or it gets mentioned with sociopathy. And a so person who is a sociopath it doesn't mean they're out murdering people. It often just means that they don't have much of a conscience. They don't feel guilt. Um, and so sometimes they're both kind of the same there in that narcissistic people may not feel a lot of guilt and be out for themselves and know how to sweet talk you, you know, know <laughs> how to love bomb you, know how to, uh, come on to you as being a good person that really cares about you a lot. But then in the course of, and, and I've, you know, I've coached women who have gotten out of narcissistic or relationships with people who would be described as narcissistic. Um, and so I don't know if that answers your question, Jeffrey, but it's, it's like everything else in the world. We can put it on a scale. There's a, a polarity there. And there's one end of the spectrum, and then there's all the way to the other end of the spectrum. So self-love is going to be in the healthy part of the spectrum. And narcissism is going to be where that's all there is is self-love. <laughs> not <laughs> love and care for anyone else, right? I think that's, that's a good uh, description. Yeah. That's my description. I, I yeah. could, you know, if we were to, uh, if we were to query this with a, uh, a psychiatrist, I may be completely wrong. Like, I don't claim to be an expert here. Um, well, yeah, I, I mean, I'm sure they would con they would uh, consult the DSM to find out exactly what the <laughs> official mental health definition of of a narcissist was, and and that would you know that would also inform perhaps a, a different interpretation of it. I, I'd like to throw out something that might be a little bit controversial mm -hmm. about narcissism, okay? Um, because it, obviously a lot of this has to do with how you def define words. Um, Narcissism is a word that we normally use in a very negative sense. It means essentially. Well, we're usually talking about a narcissistic personality disorder. Yeah. yeah. Right. We're right. talking, and we're particularly we're talking about a behavior pattern exhibited by one or more people who are representative of that so-called disorder. Yes. And I say so-called because it all depends on your perspective. 
I, my perspective is very similar to yours. I mean, I, I certainly tend to see certain people as narcissistic and other people as, you know, more friendly, social type people and all that kind of stuff. But by the same token, I have to ask myself, if we are all human beings, all creatures on this earth who are going through our lives, basically swimming through the contrast, like you described before, we are saying, I like this. I don't like that. I choose that. I don't choose that. I prefer this. I don't prefer that. And we run into somebody who makes a bunch of choices that we don't like and that we disapprove of and that we think is representative of somebody who doesn't give a crap about somebody else. And we don't, we don't, we definitely look down our noses at that. We think, think that's a bad thing. Right. Who does that reflect on? Does that reflect on that person or does it reflect on us? And the reason I, I asked that question is because of a quote that came from Abraham that I, it is literally the only quote from all of Abraham's six, seven, eight books, however they, many they have that I have literally extracted, put into a, um, a word document and kept on hand because I use it so frequently. So what is it? So I'll read it to you. It says their disapproval of me. And this is part of, that I like about it. it's both ways. Their disapproval of me is their lack. If there are others who see something in you that they do not approve of, most often you see their disapproval reflected back through their eyes and you feel that you've gone wrong in some way. And we say to you, it's not your lack, it's theirs. It's their inability to be the allower that brings forth their negative emotion. It's not your imperfection. And in like fashion, when you feel negative emotion because you've seen something in others that you do not want to see, it is not their lack, it is your own. And so when you make the decision that you want to see only that which pleases you, then you will begin to see only that which pleases you. And all of your experiences will bring forth positive emotion because by the law of attraction, you will attract to yourself only that which is in harmony with what you want. By understanding the power of your emotions, you can then direct your thoughts and then you will no longer need others to behave differently in order for you to feel good. Well, something that stands out to me from all of that is the idea of approval. Mm. And first of all, if we're seeking approval, that's always, you know, going to be something that's going to cause us pain <laughs> because we're never going to get the approval that we want from every source we're trying to seek approval from if we're a people pleaser, if we're approval seeking. But the other part of the problem is that we often we often disapprove of ourselves. No kidding. Right? Yeah. Going back to the discussion of like, oh, I shouldn't be feeling this way or I shouldn't be having these thoughts or I shouldn't be doing these things, right? It's like and we put all of this in this category of things we disapprove of of ourselves. Instead of recognizing that they're all human experiences and emotions and they're all just giving us information. We can totally approve of it. That's right. So I, I actually looked up the dictionary definition of narcissism. Oh, okay. Inordinate fa fascination with oneself, excessive self-love. So, you know, Jeffrey's question about what's the difference between self-love and narcissism, it's degrees. It's just a matter of degrees at its simplest. It's just a matter of degrees. <laughs> It's an interesting question, and it, I think the most fascinating part is that we we get caught up in stuff like that because – and I think that's why I like the Abraham quote so much because ultimately, if somebody else is a narcissist, why does it matter? Right. I get it. I get it. So here's why it matters. <laughs> here's okay. Why, here's why it might matter. <laughs> okay. Because there's nothing we can do about it, Right. I, there, there's not. It's like any other behavior. I can't. If you're well, a narcissist, can, there's nothing I can do about it. I mean, that's right. Well, we can but, influence them, but but I wouldn't recommend spending a lot of time on that. <laughs> well, but here's where it might matter. It's because we are all wired for connection and we're in relationship with each other. True. Yes. So where it might matter, and and I don't even mean as far as diagnosing. You know, I have to say it's one of my pet peeves. I have known certain people in my life that are constantly diagnosing everyone. Like everyone's a sociopath, <laughs> everyone's a narcissist, you know, it's, oh, that person's a narcissist. Okay. So we learned a word and we know what it means. And now it's everybody, right? um, but that's not to say that there aren't sociopaths and narcissists out there. Sure. Right. They're out there where it matters is in, 
in your relationship. Where it matters is in your ability to make boundaries that are there to help you and protect you. Where it matters is who you're in relationship with. Now, remember that I, and I know this is just some idea that someone said, but I like it. And it's the idea, I think it was Jim Rohn, who said that you are, right, you are like the sum of the five people that you spend the most time with. And that's why in like professional, personal growth kind of business, like situations, those coaches are always going to urge you to like hang around with people that are successful, right? And I think that because of that idea that we hear that birds of a feather flock together, for the most part, that's going to be true, right? If you're a person that cares about certain things, you're probably going to be hanging around with people who care about those things too. That just makes sense. Uh, but we do sometimes either get into relationship with someone who has maybe qualities that would be labeled narcissistic, um, or maybe we're born into a family that has members that may fall into that category. This is where it matters. It only matters. Your experience is what matters to you. It's That's right. how you protect yourself, how you, and you do that by respecting yourself. You know, I've said this before. I always thought, especially growing up with two things. One was teachings from religions that said very simply, right? You reap what you sow. Mm -hmm. And then law of attraction comes along with basically saying the same thing, right? Yep. Like attracts like. So I thought, hmm, and I've talked to lots of people who have these same thoughts. It's like, well, what's going on then? Because I'm, I'm nice to everyone. I'm a good person. I treat people in a good way with respect. And so why is this coming? Why am I having this come back to me? Why are people not being nice to me? Why am I in a relationship where I'm suffering from some kind of abuse why am i you know if all i do and i i really it was really puzzling to me for a while mm -hmm. I thought, oh my gosh i go out of my way i really go out of my way i never say no to anybody people will call me can you help me with this sure i'll drop everything right <laughs> and then one day probably after i saw that sad face in the mirror i realized this isn't about me treating other people well and then other people will treat me well this is about how I treat myself mm. and I always put myself last. Ah. I always drop everything to go help someone else. I always defer to everyone else's desires. And even in relationship where someone was not treating me well, I continued to treat them well. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I was like, well, no, I'm supposed to treat everybody. Well, I'm a good person. I want to be a good, but it was, it turned into people pleasing. That's, that's where it's going to matter. Yeah. So as soon as you have enough, the same amount of respect for yourself as you do for other people, hopefully, you know, and we're talking about healthy people here. Um, <laughs> as, soon, <laughs> as soon as you treat yourself well and you put yourself in that same level, like I said, that might seem like a small thing. You know, when someone would ask me, um, Cindy, what movie do you want to see? I would say, I don't care. What do you want to see? What do you want for dinner? I don't care. What do you want? Where do you want to go on vacation? I don't care where you, I was everything. It didn't matter who it was or what they asked me. I'd always deferred back to them. And that's where the universe had to start showing up as a mirror for me and saying, okay, I guess you want to be last. I was just reading in the, uh, the live stream. Uh, Jenny has jumped in on the conversation has been sharing some stuff. Hi, she Jenny. Says, she says, I can relate to Cindy's realization about sadness, seeing herself very sad. She said, I suddenly realized I don't feel valued and I don't feel respected. And I later realized this guy didn't respect women in general. You know that I'm really glad, Jenny, that you brought this up because that is one of those. There are some what we call early warning red flags. Yes. <laughs> right. So so a lot of the. A lot of the um, symptoms, if you will, um, signs of people that may be abusive or, you know, may not be good relationship material. <laughs> that way. A lot of them you don't see right away, especially when someone is putting on their very best charming behavior mm -hmm. in the beginning. Right. And so you might not see them, but that actually is one of the signs that you may see right away is especially with 
uh, misogyny is, you know, how does this person talk about their mother and their sisters and their female coworkers? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that always, you know, you hear this, but it always gets me when I hear it is because you hear it like in movies and TV shows is the, the man will say to the woman or the, you know, the, the high school or college boy will say to the girl, say, you're not like all the other girls, or you're not like that. Hmm, won't say the word that mm -hmm. I used to, that I used to be with. Oh, right? <laughs> right. You're so much better than all of. And so, but when someone says that they're discounting your whole gender, mm. Mm -hmm. right? Yes. Absolutely. So it sounds like a compliment. If I were to say, you know, to, to my husband, when I met him, Oh, you're not like all the other guys who are just a bunch of jerks, right? You're not like, a, but what I'm really saying is that all men are jerks, except you. <laughs> except <That's> you. A, <laughs> it's really just a charming thing, right? It's a, right. it's a spell that you're casting. So, so to notice that, that you don't feel valued and you don't re feel respected and to, to pay attention and realize, well, no kidding, because this guy just doesn't value or respect women, period. Mm. Um, that's a, actually a sign that you can pick up on maybe on a first date, like it just start talking. <laughs> you can see it pretty early. Yeah. And I know for myself now, obviously I wasn't, uh, I, I'm heterosexual and I wasn't going after men. I was going after women, but you know, the basic rules still apply. It's, it's the yeah. same thing, either direction. Right. When, when I was, in that single space, my self-esteem needed a lot of work. Yeah. It was not, it was not in a good place. And it got lower and lower as time went on because I just had failure after failure. And of course it becomes sort of a negative spiral and just, well, more right. than sort of, it was a definite negative spiral. It was pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. But what I also learned later on after I, um, fortuitously dropped all of my hopes, which were really holding me back. And in the process of dropping them, met Louisa a month later, and everything came, you know, shooting up That's after the that. Resistance is what. Yeah, you I'm know. like, oh, the resistance. Yeah, oh boy, in a big way. I basically said, I, I quit relationships, and then I got a relationship. But, <laughs> <laughs> but after that, I also did a lot of work building myself, loving myself, feeling good about myself. And an interesting perception came to me that I didn't realize was going to happen. The more that I loved myself, the easier it was for me to spot the person I didn't want to be around. Yeah. I think you're right about that. Sure. Yeah. Because it, because it's not a vibrational match. That's right. And that's why I say, you know, sometimes when you start showing yourself a lot of self-love and, you know, there's, there's one of two things that happen and you hear these stories all the time, right? It's like, I worked with this person and they were just rude to me and they were never nice to me. And they, they, they were just awful to be around. And then I started really loving myself and respecting myself. And it's like, they just changed. Like all of a sudden they greeted me this morning when I went in, it's like, Oh my goodness, what's happening. Okay. So yeah, sometimes that happens. But the other thing that happens sometimes is that you just suddenly become so glowing with self love that you're not a match to them anymore and right. something will happen to where you're not even around each other anymore because there's just so much, it's like that magnet, like repelling, you know, that kind of thing. So one of two of those things, that's usually what happens when you make a dramatic change in how you show up for yourself. It's but true. when you're, when you're people pleasing all the time, remember that what happens to your self, self esteem is it just goes right in the trash bin yeah. because you're basically giving your subconscious a message. Now, remember your subconscious is what creates everything and your subconscious doesn't judge anything. Mm -hmm. If I think to myself, wow, I really blew it today. What a loser. I am just, I am, I'm just not good at this. My subconscious does not say, Oh, that's a bad thought. Don't think that you're going to create, you know, bad self-esteem. My subconscious just goes, okay. Yeah, right. All right. Loser. Bye. <laughs> okay. I guess we're a loser now. Um, I mean, it's, you know, we can, we can laugh about it, but it really is true is that when you're yeah. always deferring to everyone else, yes, your subconscious gets the message that you're last. Mm -hmm. And when you're always valuing everyone else higher than yourself, right? When, when you look at other people in the world, and you always see them as smarter than you, when you always see them as more talented than you, when you see them as better than you, when you see them as, you know, and, and you feel bad about yourself, 
the more thoughts you have like that, it's like the more your self-esteem lowers and lowers and lowers yeah. instead of just being just accepting, you know, that's what we all would benefit from in a relationship. And to me, that's the best relationship is when, and I have that and it's a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. My husband, ex he knows me through and through. I am as real with him as I can possibly be. And he loves me and accepts me for exactly who I am. He's not trying to change me into something else. You know, it, it, all my flaws, everything. And I with him, like I'm not trying to manipulate him into changing into something else. Is he perfect? No. Am I perfect? No, but we're perfect for each other. And we accept each other. And the beginning of that is accepting yourself. It doesn't mean that you're perfect. You know, I saw something that was a real eye opener. It said, don't, it said something like, I don't know if it's talking about going to the gym or dieting or whatever, but it said, you know, don't do those things because you hate your body. Do those things because you love your body. Mm -hmm. See, that's the difference in intention is that I'm doing things to take care of myself or to change myself, right? To improve myself or to better myself because I love myself. Not because I'm disapproving and I need to change to be, you know, something that I approve of or anyone else. That's a great thing too, because when you're in that space, that's a space of self-love, of self-confidence, and it's a space of clarity, incredible oh, clarity. Yeah. I mean, we, we've been talking about examples of people who we, we have unhealthy relationships with and they're very extreme kind of situations and so forth. But the funny thing is, as you get yourself healthier by, by loving yourself more and showing yourself more appreciation and all that kind of thing, the discernment power just becomes unbelievably sharp. And I'll give you an example without going into too many details. A few years back, I came within millimeters, really, really close to entering a three-way partnership on a business venture that potentially could have been really lucrative. And I backed out of it at the last minute. I was the one who ended the business relationship. Mm -hmm. And without going into the details of the personalities involved, because I'm not, I'm not here to kind of put down where they're at or anything like that. There was one person who was involved who had some issues where he doesn't really have a, a good handle on how to um, how to deal with his own anger and deal with his own fears and so forth. And so he always wants to have somebody else take it out on it, a, a, a good listener, you know, and then he just dumps all their all his crap on them. Mm -hmm. And I realized this person, if we got went ahead with this business venture, it was going to be a bad situation because he was going to be in charge of a bunch of people. And I did not want to be responsible for putting a whole bunch of people under him. On top of that, I was having my own issues with him, and they'd been growing over time. Bottom line was, I went to the, the, the other person who was going to be the, the third partner in this. And this was like right at the end, right, right before everything was going to fall apart. And I knew things were likely to fall apart, but there was still a piece of me that wanted to try to hold it together. Like, this, this was a great business idea. This is something that could really do well. I wanted to hold it together. So I went to him. And this is a guy who I respect a lot, who has some you know, really good understanding about people skills, um, he's generally a very supportive person and so forth. And I said to him, I need to talk to you about this other person who's in our partnership here. Mm -hmm. And I need you to promise to just hear me out and promise you're not going to say to him what I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. And he refused to do it. He refused to agree to that because in his view, and he has a lot of business experience, in his view, that was not a healthy business partner relationship. And I can respect that. I understand his right. viewpoint. And as soon as I heard him say that, I knew I had to end the relationship between the three of us because my discernment had told me, yes, Gary, I understand what you're talking about, but you forgot one thing. You told me you want me in this business relationship because you trust me. Where did that trust go? Mm -hmm. He wasn't trusting me. Mm -hmm. He wasn't trusting me. And that was a bit of an eye opener. This guy, I, I didn't mean to mention his name, but this guy who I thought very highly of was demonstrating to me that all he had told me was not really true. Kind of like what you mentioned about the person who says, well, you're different from all the other girls. You're different from all the other guys. You know, well, wait a minute. Okay. If you really believe that, treat me that way. Yeah. Treat me that way. 
Now, I would never have discerned that one if I hadn't built up my own self-love. That one would have skipped right by me. Well, that's the thing is that once you start treating yourself the way you want to be treated, mm -hmm. right, and it's really obvious, like I encourage people, we hear a lot about self-care, right, especially in, in kind of life coachy circles, we, we hear a lot about self-care and especially with women, you know, people all, all automatically always talk about, you know, getting a manicure or a massage or, you know, things like that. Fine. Those things are great. But those things are actually in the category of pampering. And self-care is, you know, eating food that's healthy and drinking enough water and making clear boundaries and having healthy relationships. And so when you do those things and you do them with the intention of self-love, you know, like mm -hmm. the way you love your, your cats, right? Mm -hmm. If I were to babysit your cats, I would feed them and I would water them and I would let them out or whatever I would need to do, but I wouldn't do it with the level of love you have for them because no, they're like, they're babies, right? Sure. So that's what I'm talking about is when we take care of ourselves to do it with love. Mm -hmm. And you're right. It sharpens our discernment in all of our relationships because suddenly we are subconscious, I guess, is recognizing how we should be treated. Mm -hmm. We teach the universe how to treat us. We teach other people how to treat us by how we treat ourselves. Mm -hmm. So it's, it starts with small things, but you're right. It opens up into uh, everything. It mm -hmm. opens up into everything that goes on in our life. It affects, yeah. it affects your entire experience. So it's important. By the way, interesting uh, side story that goes along with that. We did, I did end up breaking up that uh, business venture just before we were getting ready to launch. And it was a tough thing to do because I really wanted to do the business venture, but I also knew right. it, was, it was the right thing to do to break it up. And I had an interesting and rather unexpected side effect come out of it. I felt better about myself. Yes. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I well, felt what? better about myself. <laughs> Yeah, anytime we get out of a relationship that's not healthy, and basically that's what was happening. You were yeah, entering yeah. into a partnership and you saw the signs, the inevitable signs that the relationship was not going to be as healthy as it could be because we don't always have control over someone else's behavior. When we remove ourselves from those situations, often it's hard to do. Uh, it can be painful. We may experience loss because of it, but we always feel better about ourselves. We absolutely do. Yeah. And it, it makes a big difference when we start realizing We have realizing to live with ourselves. So we want to feel better about ourselves. You think? Right? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know about you. I do mirror exercises again. I, I stopped doing them and I came back to doing them again. And I'm seeing myself in the mirror every day and I'm having these conversations. It's so, great. yeah, it's important to take care of myself. Yeah. I see myself every day. <laughs> and if you're just listening and, and you don't know what Walt's talking about, um, the very the simple mirror work that we're talking about is – um, just looking at yourself in the mirror and just giving yourself some kudos for whatever you've done that day, letting yourself know that you love yourself uh, and that you're awesome and that you're doing a great job, whatever it is. We're all doing the best we can, right? So even on the days when we feel like nothing has gone right or we haven't done everything right, we can still look ourselves in the eye in the mirror and say, give yourself a pep talk like you would give anybody that you care about, right? If your best friend came to you and said, I had the worst day today, nothing I did turned out right. I made mistakes. I treated people in ways I don't like to treat people. I just, today was a total loss. What would you say to your best friend? You would say, oh, well, tomorrow's another day. Mm -hmm. You would say, look, kid, it's okay. We all have bad days and you're doing great. And tomorrow you're going to do great. And I love you. And chin up. It's going to be okay. But what do we say to ourselves? <laughs> right do we say oh man like you're a total loser right Ugh. yeah sometimes we talk to ourselves in ways we would never talk to our best friend so that's what the mirror work is about is just when you're in the mirror i mean most of us are in the mirror at some point in the day brushing our teeth washing our face whatever it is spend a couple times to look you know a couple moments look yourself in the eye and give yourself some love it's as simple as that by the way, there's a really great test about looking in the mirror that's really, really helpful. If you're not really okay. sure about whether you're self-critical, look right. in the mirror and say to yourself, I love you, and then notice your reaction. That will yeah. tell you how self-critical you really are. 
right? It's re I, whenever I give people mirror work as an exercise, as a coach, I always tell them, this may be really hard. You may not be able to look at yourself. You may <laughs> feel stupid. You may think it's ridiculous. You may want to quit. Like, just, just stay with it mm -hmm. for a week. Just stay with it every day. Just say, I love you. And doesn't it change? It just changes. Oh, it changes quickly. Our response yeah. to it changes. Yeah. Yeah, that I part changes. When very you were fast. first doing mirror work, you were like, "Oh, what am I doing?" <laughs> I do this. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> that first day, I'll never forget it. I mean, I had committed to doing like a minute or two of mirror work every day. The first day lasted about five seconds, <laughs> and it was long enough for me to say "I love you" and then wince and turn away from the mirror, and that was done. <laughs> And that was when when we decided 30 days. You were like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it for 30 days. And then the first day, you were like, oh, man, it was terrible. <laughs> what have I got myself <laughs> into? That's what I thought. <laughs> but I, I still remember the day that you said, guess what? Today's day 50. And I feel yeah. like, and, and this is what you said. You said, it's day 50, and I noticed something today. I noticed that all my mental chatter mm. and my negative self-talk, you said, it's not completely gone, but it's sort of like when a TV is on in the other room and you can hear it, but it's not interesting to you. So you just don't even pay attention. And I thought, wow, that is stunning. That is an amazing result. And, and you'll remember that was why I st started doing the mirror work in the first place, because you shared the Jack yeah. Canfield article with me yeah. in which he told right. how he had used this to get rid of the negative self-talk. And exactly. I was really dealing with a negative self-talk and yeah. boy, was it nice one. And it went away. Oh my God. It was so quiet in my head. <laughs> I love it. Well, and we started this, we started this podcast today talking about the reason why so many people may think that, a, you know, a soulmate for them is not out there. No good men out there. No good women out there. Where are they? They're invisible to me. And part of it, if not all of it has to do with that self-talk that's going on and yeah, that yeah. story that you're telling over and over because Remember that the whatever the thinker thinks the prover is going to prove. We always prove our our story. We prove it. We find that evidence to make it true. And so mirror work can actually be like process number one if you if you're looking for a relationship. And for those who might be considering it but are, are kind of like, oh, I'm not so sure I really want to try it. I'll, I'll give you one little taste that might make it easier for you. I now, I call it mirror work, but I now think of it as mirror play. It's actually fun. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. It yeah. wasn't fun at first, but boy, it has become, I mean, I look forward to it every morning now. Yeah, I do too. When I see myself in the mirror, I go, hey, yeah. <laughs> like I just ran into like my favorite person. Exactly. Yes. Well, actually you did really, <laughs> but it comes down to it. <laughs> Some oh, good stuff. Cool. Hey, by the way, folks, if you're not yet subscribed to the podcast, and I know most of you are, I don't know if I told you what the latest numbers are, Cindy, but we're averaging about 550 people per episode now. Yeah. It's really growing. And awesome. we love every one of them, and, and almost all of them are subscribers. But a few of them we know just from the way we can see what happens with the numbers aren't subscribing. So we want to invite you to become a subscriber. And it's so easy and it's so free. You just go to the homepage of our website, LOAToday.net, and at the top of the page there are instructions that take you one, maybe two, perhaps on rare occasions, three clicks. And then you're subscribed, and all of our episodes come streaming right to your device as we publish them every day. And check us out on YouTube also, because when we record Monday through Friday, I record with my various co-hosts every single day, Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. New York time. We record live streaming to YouTube. That's where Jeffrey and Jenny and Dan and Nasha and a few other people have been uh, chatting in the live stream uh, while we've been talking. And, and we check the live stream, and we incorporate uh, questions and comments from the live stream, as we did today in the conversation. So you know, join us there as well. Uh, but you don't actually have to be listening to the live stream to have your questions answered or addressed here on the show. So I want to invite you to send them in because um, we're going to be doing relationships for the, the foreseeable future. Yes. And uh, it's, it's your opportunity to talk to somebody in Cindy who is a, truly an expert. I mean, she has been doing this for, was it a decade you've been doing it for now? It's about 12 years. Yeah. 12 years. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So all kinds of experience there. And you're, you're just going to get some really good insights into what's going on with your particular situation. So send it to, uh, you can 
reach us on Facebook. You can go to our contact form on the website at LOAToday.net or send me an email, Walt at LOAToday.net. Cindy, do you want to give your email out? Do you want people to send you questions? Uh, you can send me questions. It's uh, Cindy at CindyChavez.com or if you go to my website, CindyChavez.com, there's a contact form. You can find me on Facebook. Come follow me on Facebook, uh, Cindy Chavez, C-I-N-D-I-E-C-H-A-V-E-Z. And, you know, there's so, yeah, there's lots of ways you can get a question to us, but we would love that. Very, very good. Yes. And uh, by the way, um, just to give you a little heads up, not only will we be addressing questions, any questions that come in over the next week, um, next Wednesday, but I'm going to make it a point next week to spend a little more time on what does it take to actually be better at loving yourself? So let, let's let's start you know, focusing on that. What, what what can we do? We talked about mirror exercises. That's one thing mm -hmm. you can do. But there are lots of things you can do. So let's lots see what we can talk about for next week. Excellent. Perfect. So, Thank you, Cindy. As usual, wow. you are sterling. Absolutely wonderful. I love being here. Thank I love it too. Me. Thank <laughs> you to our live streamers, especially thank you to our podcast listeners as well. We'll see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, everyone.